So here we are in week four of Advent, and over the last couple of weeks, we have been preparing our hearts for Christmas morning. Uh, Less than a week to go, and all of a sudden, Christmas is upon us. Uh, Advent is that season where we look ahead to the coming Christmas. And as we look ahead to Christmas morning, we also look backward. Uh, We remind ourselves of that first Christmas some 2,000 years ago where God stepped from eternity into his creation and into earth as he came in the form of a man. And over the last couple of weeks, we've looked at various Advent topics of hope and peace and joy and how all of those are found in Jesus Christ. And today on the fourth week of Advent, we consider the topic of love. The love that is in Christ, the love that God has for humanity, for his creation, and the love that is shown to us. You know, when we talk of love, it's, it's just such a huge topic. It's one of those ones that resonates through everything we see and do. It, it resonates through our hearts because each one of us longs to experience love. Uh, we want to be loved and we want to give love. You know, the world uses the term love so freely uh, that often we kind of look at it and go, is that really love? And often when we are honest, uh, we use the word love, but what we're talking about or what we're experiencing has got nothing to do with love. Some of us have sadly heard somebody say they love us, uh, only later to have that love revoked as they then declare they no longer love us. We've had that tremendous heartbreak of that crushing weight of losing love. And maybe what we want to experience again in this Christmas time is to experience the the true love, to experience what love really is. You know, many of us on Christmas morning in these few days' time will open gifts from our family members, and these gifts will be tokens of love. And yes, we will accept and experience and, and know the love that they show us because of those gifts. We might even hear somebody say they love us. But you and I know that love isn't only expressed in gifts. In fact, sometimes love is really easy to express in gifts. We might give something, whether it is a Christmas gift or perhaps some other gift, flowers or meals or or other little tokens, and we know that it is easy to give. That's why for many of us, we might not be moved by the expressions of love in those regards. We only truly know that someone loves us when they serve in some way, when they sacrifice, when they condescend and come down to a level of serving us. I'm reminded of a, a married couple in the previous ministry I was involved in where the wife had tragically had a stroke. Uh, And and she had had a stroke nearly two decades before we got there. And this stroke had rendered one half of her body largely uh, kind of immovable. And and it really didn't respond. And the other half of her body sort of had slight response. And so her husband for nearly two decades had cared for her, had cleaned her, had washed her, had done all those things that we might be embarrassed about to simply show his love for his wife. The stroke had taken away her voice and she couldn't even express truly that sense of love. And I look at that and I think there is love in action. Love that condescends, love that serves another. I think life-changing love requires self-demotion. And I think that's what we see, I believe, that's what we see at Christmas time. Because Christmas reminds us that's exactly what God did for us. That's exactly what God did in Christ Jesus. It's this demotion as God steps from heaven, steps from eternity into this finite realm that God has created. 
You know, according to Philippians chapter 2, Christ took these series, these steps of demotions and came to be this Christmas child. You know, if you have your Bibles and you want to turn to Philippians chapter 2, you know, there's a little bit of background here. Paul writes this letter to the church in Philippi and, and he thanks them for their partnership in the gospel. But in the middle of this informal letter that Paul writes to these Christians, Paul launches into this incredible Christological hymn to underscore the need for selfless love. And this kind of giving, this kind of love that doesn't seek to elevate, but instead demotes and condescends to serve and display itself. And this is what Christmas is all about. Paul places this incarnational example of Jesus before the divided parties in Philippi and says to them, treat each other with this kind of love. This is the love that Jesus has exemplified for us. And Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2 in, in the first 11 verses, and therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same attitude of mind that Christ Jesus had. Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a human being. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, I think when we read that passage, as intense as it is, as magnificent, this Christological hymn focusing on God, I, I think we occasionally miss some of what's been put out there. We miss the implication of what's being described. We're so familiar with Paul's words that we miss their impact. Uh, this passage has been the topic of many Christmas sermons. In addition, I think we, over Christmas time, get a, in a hurry to focus on the human perspective, to focus on those wonderful elements of the story and the characters of Christmas. So we, we look to the shepherds, we look to the families, we look to kind of those little elements around it. And we see it Christmas, we see it from our human perspective. But I wonder how often we miss the perspective from God. To see Christmas and Christmas morning, the love that Christ gives, the love that God displayed from the perspective of Christ. Christ went through a series of demotions. He came from heaven to earth. Christ became a man. He became a serving man rather than a man of affluence and wealth. And ultimately, he becomes a sacrifice, submitting to death in order to become our Savior. And these steps, as Christ comes down. I wonder if we've ever stopped to think about that very first step. That first step of condescension as Christ moves from eternity, from heaven to earth. You know, we've only ever known this earthly realm. We've only ever known our experience from the perspective of earth. What must it have been like for God eternal? You know, we have no categories to help us understand eternity, to help us understand heaven and what it must have been like. 
as one part of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, honored in this incredible relationship, this incredible eternity, filled with sights and sounds and beauty that the, the writers in Scripture struggle to describe. They use language that we might understand. They use language of precious jewels, of gold. They use language of pure water, of abundant food, of celebration. But even so, we struggle to grasp and comprehend what that eternal presence of the Godhead must have been like. I can only imagine the, the legion of angels kind of marveling at this unity, marveling at this relationship, marveling at this intimacy that God, the Godhead, the Trinity experienced. And yet this is what Christ steps out of. This is what Christ leaves. And from that position of being on the throne, from that position of Godhead, Christ comes down and is born as a human you know, when, when Jesus first landed, dare I say that, when Jesus first stepped into this earth, the first thing he experiences is this human birth. And now we might think that birth is exciting and, and when we understand that birth leads to new life and there's the celebration, but, but the experience of birth can be scary. Ask any couple that's gone through it. Ask a, a husband that's fainted in the middle of his wife's childbirth. It's this crazy uh, time, there's all this emotion, and there's all this chaos that's happening in the place of birth. It's messy, it's painful, it's uncomfortable, and this is how Jesus enters into earth, right in the middle of it. Not only did Jesus know the stress of being born into a world like ours, but imagine the first smells and sounds and the first experiences now, there's a lot of debate around whether children or babies can see immediately from birth. But there's agreement that babies can hear and they can smell. And indeed, they can even sense others around them. Can we pause with, without being too graphic, but can we imagine the first smells that Christ experienced uh, we understand the Christ in this, this barnyard environment, this inner kind of position of the house filled with animals and livestock. And the first smells that Christ must have smelt include urine from animals and, and feces from animals. And yet this is what Christ steps into. And the sounds, yes, indeed, of parents uh, there expressing love, but at the same time, the sounds of livestock bleating for their next meal. After all, we know that Christ is placed in the feeding trough. I'm pretty sure some animals were pretty upset about that. And this is the, the, diff, the vast chasm that Christ steps from eternity down to this. This is Christmas love. This is the love that Christ shows. This is what it cost Jesus Christ. And it wasn't just his childbirth. We read in the Gospels as his ministry began and through the, the time of his ministry as Christ taught and showed his love. And yet he was still rejected. There were rulers and Pharisees and teachers of the law who rolled their eyes and who scoffed at him and tried to discredit him and refused to acknowledge that this was God before them. And they refused to accept this love that came to deliver, this love that came to restore relationship. You know, I, I look at that and I contemplate at Christmas time and, and I'm kind of forced to ask that question, how do you go from uninterrupted eternal fellowship for eternity in the Godhead into a stable where you're you're messing your diapers and you're completely powerless what prompts one to make such a drastic step that blows our minds well indeed love it is Christmas love that prompts God, that prompts Christ to go this length and this distance for you and for me. And this is why I'm talking about demotion. 
True love knows no other way. Love requires demotion. Love requires condescending. Love requires stepping down. And Christmas love knows no other way. The love that motivated Jesus to take all of these steps down would cost Jesus everything. And indeed, love is costly. In fact, that's the, the reason that Paul even gives us this great passage is to motivate those in the church in Philippi and indeed to motivate you and I to realize that love costs, love requires sacrifice, love requires setting aside selfish living and giving of ourselves to others. And the problem is, as Paul understood too often we refuse that downward spiral. We refuse that emotion. Because the world all around us is all about self-promotion. It's all about getting ahead and getting beyond and further than others. We learn it from our earliest days all the way through our lives. From the moment of birth where we discover that others will meet our needs. And so as the infant cries and mom responds by bringing food... And then we move on to the toddler that kind of almost misbehaves and gets dad's attention until dad leaves the younger sibling to play with the toddler. Even at older ages, siblings often demand privileges that are equal to or perhaps even greater than their brothers or sisters. We want more. We want more and more. And this carries on even into adulthood. We want higher paying jobs. We want bigger and better and more comfortable homes. We want prestigious cars and extravagant lifestyles. And the lives we live start to urge and start to lead towards dominating others rather than the demotion that Christmas shows us, rather than this love to serve. And so what Paul is suggesting here to the Philippian community is that if they are going to make it as a church, if they're going to make it in the world around them and truly impact their world, then someone has to break that cycle. Someone has to break that cycle of self-preservation and, and advancement. And someone has to imitate Jesus Christ and step downward and to demote themselves. This is what Jesus did. Has Jesus in this Trinity, in this Godhead of Father, Son, and Spirit understood what was truly needed for humanity to be reconciled to God, to be brought back into relationship? Jesus makes it very clear throughout the Gospel of John that nobody took his life or nobody will take his life. Jesus made it very clear that he offered himself it's almost like in that Trinity, in that Godhead moment, Jesus said, I volunteer. I will step out of what we have here. I will step out of perfection. I, I won't hold on to my title and I will give of myself. I will become as nothing and I will offer my life. I will be demote, demoted. This is the way Christmas love works we want love to work a little more comfortably. We, we don't like pain in love. Yet true love involves pain. True love involves giving. And when we contemplate Christmas love, when we read a passage like we've just read in Philippians, we kind of say, well, how do we respond? What's the application of this? What do we do with this? Well, my friends, perhaps this Christmas... Instead of seeking to receive, instead of seeking to get, instead of seeking to make it all about ourselves, maybe this Christmas you and I need to take a step down for someone else. Maybe we need to give up and let go of past grievances. Maybe we need to forgive offenses of the past. We need to put our personal agendas aside for the cause of Christ and for the sake of the gospel. And you and I need to learn to serve, even if it's serving someone who may not deserve it, according to us. <laughs> we certainly never deserved the price that it cost Jesus to serve us. 
His entire life spoke of service. Born as a baby, submitting to his parents, washing his disciples' feet, carrying a cross on his back, he served despite what it cost him, despite the inconvenience. And some of us, perhaps this Christmas, need to let go of some things. Christmas love demands it. Yes, ordinarily, Christmas is about getting. That's the way the world looks at it. What are we getting for Christmas? But love asks us, what are we giving for Christmas? What are we giving to those who may not deserve it, but who desperately need it. This is what Christmas love is all about. As Christ gave of himself and indeed gave himself for those who did not deserve it, but those who desperately needed to be restored to relationship with their heavenly father. Christ didn't consider equality with the Godhead something to be hold on to and something to be kind of pushed, but rather he let go. And he humbled himself. He gave up and condescended and gave us life because of love. It might be at this Christmas time, as you contemplate this coming Christmas, you simply need to receive that gift of love and receive the Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the time to recognize it. This is the time to remind ourselves that centuries ago, God came. Christ gave himself that we might experience Christmas love and we might experience life forevermore. Today and at this Christmas time, my prayer for you is that you would be reminded that love came down. That love walked among creation. That love gave himself up for us. And that love has a name. And that name is Jesus Christ. And all we are required to do is to receive that love. And then as we receive that love, to go and do likewise. May the Lord bless you in this fourth week of Advent as you contemplate the love of God found in Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you that you are love, eternal love, love personified. And Jesus, in that love, you stepped from eternity You stepped from perfection. You stepped from that infinite presence of God as God. And rather than clinging to that, rather than hanging on to that, you gave it up. And you took on flesh. Being born. Being born in this poor and destitute place. Has this child helpless and and in need of others. But yet, Jesus, as you walked this earth, your life was one of love and service and of continual giving that ultimately culminated on the cross. And we we marvel that you came aware that that was your future and yet you still came because you love us. Indeed, God, for you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in that Son would not perish but would receive eternal life. God, I pray for each person watching and celebrating and contemplating Advent and this coming Christmas. I pray that once again, each one of us would be reminded of the love of God, that love that came to earth. And I pray that each one of us would again receive that love. But then, Lord, that we would receive and we would go and do likewise and display true Christmas love to those around us, those who don't deserve it, but those who need it. God, I pray that your kingdom would come and your name would be glorified in our midst. For we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you.